A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime News, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our case this week, a 37 year old Ohio mother was caught on a dash cam injecting her ex-husband with elephant poison, killing him in minutes. His disappearance became a matter of national security because he worked for the State Department. He was in the middle of a custody battle with the mother of his three children. And not only was she charged in connection with his murder, but so were her boyfriend and her mother. This is definitely a case that you have got to hear in order to believe all of this. Our guest today is Rachel Fassay, an attorney specializing in white collar criminal defense, government investigations and other complex litigation. Rachel is also a legal analyst for several news outlets and a regular contributor to True Crime News, the podcast. And as and we love to say a friend of the show. Welcome back, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to see you. It's such a pleasure. You know, this case is insane. I believe that if this murder had not been captured on the dash camera, that especially when we're dealing with the disappearance and then murder of a State Department employee, that I think everyone would have been thinking this is espionage, um, you know, foreign agents at work here, and and things would have maybe initially looked very different. But because of this video, we have such a clear idea and narrative of what happened to this man. Absolutely. The video is damning. It shows the details and it led to a confession. One thing before we get into the details that I think we really need to make clear, and and Rachel, you really pointed this out before we began, was although we have convictions on the three people involved with the death of this man, they are technically not charged with murder. Right. So this was a federal crime. And as you mentioned earlier, and we will get into the details of elephant poison, uh, this really was an investigation into the controlled substance resulting in death. And it looks, I would say that the feds were involved, the FBI was involved right away because he was a member of the State Department. So I believe they left it in the hands of the federal, uh, of the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then they had to charge it in a way that wasn't just garden variety murder. So because they had all of these kind of really ridiculous details as it relates to the poison that she injected on camera. Um, Mm -hmm. This was charged by the feds and she pled to a crime that might be less than she would have gotten in a state court if she'd been convicted of first degree murder. Do you have any feelings on that? Do you think that this should have gone uh, the route of a state court and, and charges for murder? I think if he was not a member of the State Department, we may have seen this in state court as a regular old garden variety murder because that is what it was. Uh, But I think given the Fed's involvement from the beginning and the unique circumstances and that she ended up pleading, they found a charge that was an almost life sentence, but not quite. And they found that through a federal drug charge. Such an interesting case. It really is because, you know, you've got that tranquilizer that's coming from South Africa. You've got the father who works for the State Department, um, the, the mother here who is so upset about even sharing the three children, which is just, I mean, we're talking about sharing. He wasn't taking them from her. And so you put all of this together and then the video, the fact that so much of it is captured on video. It's an astonishing, astonishing case. It's insane. It is tragic. And the tragedy is this. A man has lost his life, which is horrific. The mother of his three children will now be spending pretty much the rest of her life in prison. So now you have three girls without parents, a father who is dead and having to process the fact that your mother killed your father. How is this better? How is this better? And don't forget that grandma is also 
in prison. So uh, it, it is a very huge tragedy for the entire family. So many bad choices along the way. So many and could have been stopped every single time. I always, I always, I marvel. How is it possible? You have so many opportunities to say no, to stop your insane plan, to get it out of your head. And yet instead, most people, they just double down. And that's what happened in this case. So let's get to it. This is out of Ohio. And as we said, this was investigated by the FBI because the victim worked for the State Department. So it's unusual in that sense. There are three people who have been convicted of the crime. We have the ex-wife of the victim. So the ex-wife is Amanda Havanek, and she is 37 years old. She's been sentenced to 40 years in prison for injecting her husband with the poison, which is so strong it is 1,000, 1,000 times more potent than morphine. It is for game animals, not just a regular animal, the giant kind like giraffes, like elephants and rhinos. Okay. So, so that in itself is insane. He never, he never stood a chance. So then there is Amanda's mother. That would be Anita Green. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison for her role in this. And then there is the boyfriend from South Africa. His name is Anthony Theodoro. He is now 36 and he received an 18 year prison sentence. Okay. So all three of them involved in this insane plan are all behind bars and they could not refute the evidence (laughs) because it was captured on dash cam and we'll explain how that happened. So the victim here is Timothy Havanick. And the reason Amanda was angry with him and thought that he should die over this is because she was mad that there was a recent ruling by a judge that said that he should have custody of the three girls for the summer, summer break. She and the girls live in Ohio. He lives in Virginia because he works for the State Department in Washington, D.C. And so he was going to have the girls for the summer. This had been an ongoing issue for years between this couple. And that is what is at the heart of this, which just drives me nuts. And, And Timothy who was in Ohio for the custody hearing. That's why he was in Ohio for the hearing. And then he took the girls for the weekend. He was staying at a hotel. They played in the pool. They had fun. They spent time with dad. And the murder happens just as he is dropping the girls back at, at their mother's. He leaves the car on, Rachel. He leaves the car on because he's just dropping the girls off. Clearly, it's contentious. He doesn't want to spend time talking to his ex here, just dropping the kids off. And because the car was running, the dash camera was running. And it didn't stop recording until Amanda, the ex-wife, turns the car on and turns the car off. That's right. So it records the entire time that he is dropping off the girls. You see the grandmother's roll um, on the dash cam. You see you can hear them. You can hear what's being said. And then you see what we're about to tell all the way through to the time of his death. And then Amanda goes in and she turns off the car because she is then getting ready to move the car and clear the evidence. Little does she know the major piece of evidence is that everything has been caught on video. Everything that she had planned for what they're saying was an entire year. And federal authorities have not released the video. We want to be clear about this. They describe the video. They take quotes from the video. They have released one photo. And for those of you who are listening and can't see the photo, you you know, you see the house, you you see, you know, Timothy's car, and then you see Amanda and her mother kind of tucked up close to the house, but in front of the house to the left of the screen. That is, that is really all you will see. But how frightening it is to think that these two women are, are standing there with tranquilizer in hand, ready to kill this man. 
he he had no idea what was coming to him. The girls were, you know, saying goodbye to their dad. They were brought inside the house, uh, you know, thankfully by the grandma. So the grandma was acting to get rid of the girls so they wouldn't see what was about to happen. But how horrific is this when you think about it, that the girls were inside the home when their mother killed their father? It, it looks like a pleasant family gathering from any other, uh, what, what you might imagine to be a pleasant family gathering of three girls. You have a grandmother, you have you, you know, a mother, and then you have the father who's dropping them off. But th this is just any other day. And, and I think the grandmother knew to keep the girls inside while a murder was about to happen. It's so horrific, you know, because you can hear, um, <clears throat> I believe it's Amanda who says this, uh, I've got a surprise for you inside the house, trying to get the girls in as quickly as possible. I have a surprise for you. Boy, the, those are some chilling words. The surprise is that uh -huh. I'm about to kill your father. Your grandma and I are about to kill your grand, your, your, your dad. It's, it, it makes you quiver. It, it is, it's such a mom thing to say, I have a surprise for you, come on inside. And she's been away from her, her daughters for a couple of days for a weekend. So it's nothing out of the, out of normal. It's, it's nothing unusual, except that what's about to happen is, is she's going to kill dad. Yeah. And, you know, so this happened in 2022 and it did not get a lot of media attention. And that could have been because of the the role of the State Department in this, because after sentencing is when the authorities released all this information and we're like, what? Like this, this is a huge case. So what I would like to do to better understand what led up to this and these horrible decisions made by these people is let's talk about the history of the family, the couple, and see what the buildup was to this. You'll see the red flags and you'll also see why there were so many opportunities to stop this and not do it and not do it. You know what? At the end of the day, Amanda could have had a summer off, right? The girls would have been with their dad and she could have gone on a nice long vacation with her boyfriend. It, it's it's bone chilling um, as it plays out. If you're like me, the safety of your home and your loved ones isn't just a priority. It is your everything. The problem is that old school home security systems only take action once someone is already inside your home. Simply Safe Home Security is changing that with its new Active Guard Outdoor Protection. It is the only home security designed to prevent crimes before they happen. Simply Safe helps me feel safe whether I'm at home or on vacation. I always know that my home and my belongings are covered. The best part is it is so easy to set up. With Active Guard, Simply Safe's 24 7 monitoring agents keep a close watch over your property and actually stop crimes before they happen. The cameras use advanced AI to tell the difference between friendly faces like family and neighbors and potential threats, alerting agents to suspicious individuals before they get too close to your home. These agents can talk directly to the intruder, sound a loud siren, flashlights, and even alert the police. While other security systems only react after a break-in, Simply Safe combines live monitoring and proactive protection both outside and inside your home. That is why I trust Simply Safe with my own home security every day. And I want you to have the same peace of mind. Protect your home with 50% off a new Simply Safe system plus a free indoor security camera when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash true crime. That's simplysafe.com slash true crime. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Okay, so <clears throat> Amanda and Timothy Havanick had a tumultuous relationship for years. Timothy was a high level researcher at the US State Department, reportedly working on those high tech drones and working on the security of diplomats and all that other dark stuff that happens at the State Department. Okay, so he worked in that world. 
In 2018, Amanda and Timothy and their three daughters were moved to South Africa on assignment for Tim. Tim has been deployed to South Africa to work for the State Department. According to federal prosecutors, while living there, Amanda starts to have an affair with a South African man named Anthony Theodore. So that is one of the people charged here. This affair continued even after Amanda and Timothy moved back to the United States. So two years later, Amanda is the one who files for divorce and then the custody battle begins and it gets very contentious. Investigators say that Amanda began to deny her husband, the father of the three girls, visitation with the children, despite the fact that there was a court order. So here's the part that I I need um, to ask you, Rachel. It's one thing when there is a dispute, meaning they haven't figured it out. But if I'm reading this correctly, the custody situation was figured out and the dad was supposed to have visitation. It had been decided by by a judge, Mm -hmm. but Amanda decided that, no, she doesn't need to follow the rules. That's right. So what starts to happen in that case when somebody is disobeying what the court says, that then then he and uh, Timothy could bring her back into court and and tell on her to the court. And I think that was happening. There were orders happening where she was disobeying what their custody arrangement was. And the, this gets very contentious. I mean, he he has one expectation. She should know the expectation. And she is clearly denying him what he, he believes his parental rights are. And so they are in this heated battle and he is bringing her back to court because she is not allowing uh, the visitation that that has been ordered, that has been decided. And so, and they don't live in the same state and it's not every day. They're not sharing, you know, one day on, one day off. He has less time than she has, but she would prefer to deny him all of his time. And, and that's really the setup that we're, that we're under. Which is very unfair, which is very unfair. If there are no underlying issues, then there is no reason why that father cannot see his three children. There's just no reason at all. And it doesn't, you know, the and the fact that the judge had just declared that the girls will all go to Virginia for summer break with their dad. There's nothing unusual about that. You know, they should have a chance to have summer with their dad. You know, I think what is... There's there's a lot of sadness here, but all I could think of is, you know, the girls probably being excited, right? They're going to spend summer in Virginia. They're going to, right? They're going to be at the state capitol. They're going to have fun. They're going to see their dad. Their dad's excited. He's going to have the summer with his girls. All of this is like joyous, great family stuff. Who would have thought that on that day that he returned his girls that he would be killed? And that was an immediate, a ruling that happened immediately prior to his death. So I think this plan had been in effect. Had he not won that order, we don't know what would have happened. Would she still have murdered him had she won in court the previous week and he had not gotten the summer order with the girls? We don't know the answer to that question, but she was obviously not going to let that long-term stay happen. Oh, so sad. And the federal prosecutors, when they released the information from sentencing and on this case, they said that it was their belief they had been working on this murder plot for a long time, but kind of in a more like general way. I mean, serious. I mean, there were some, there are some serious allegations here and evidence, but um, what I'm saying is, it, it, it was a seed that had been planted for at least a year in trying to kill off Timothy to solve Amanda's custody problem. But I think you're right. The urgency came with the most recent of the court rulings. It was like, that's it. We're done here. And uh, yeah, that's what she decided to do. Okay. So the judge had um, just ruled that he would be, quote, the residential parent and legal custodian of the children for two months beginning in May. Murder happened in April. 
So that gives you the timeline. So let's get to the day of the murder. April 24th, 2022. Timothy is returning the three daughters, as we've said, to the mother's home. This is after a scheduled visit. This is after this court decision. And now we can recount almost every minute of what happened because of the video. In the footage, prosecutors say, because we haven't seen the footage, prosecutors say that you can see Amanda walking toward Timothy's car and telling the children, quote, I have a surprise for you inside. And of course, the girls go inside with their grandma. Oh, this is so horrible. Seconds, 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 seconds later, Timothy is unloading the children's car seats from the car in the driveway. Remember, car is on. He doesn't want to spend any extra time here with his ex. And you hear him saying, according to federal authorities, what the heck are you doing? Did you just assault me? It's Timothy. Then he says, get away from me. Get off of me. And then the footage, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office, shows Amanda pulling on her husband's shirt as he is trying to get his cell phone to call for help, and she knocks it out of his hand. Oh, I'm so upset by this. It, this Oh, Rachel, it's awful. It's awful. I mean, and, and you're so right in that this entire interaction was so short. Uh, that the car is on the whole time. So, I, I mean, that that just tells you when somebody leaves their car on, there's certainly no expectation of anything taking any time. So the car is on this entire time. He's just zipping out of the car to dump the car seats off, basically, and, and get out of there. And while he's out, she attacks him. And the reason the attack works, as we'll get into, is because he is stuck with poison tranquilizer that's meant to knock out an elephant within minutes within you know really within seconds because you're using that tranquilizer generally speaking when an animal may be out of control and there's a safety issue for humans so she's using that on on him and and now just waiting it out and we're still in such a short time frame that he is alive getting the car seats out of the car and dead yeah, seconds. So the next thing that the U.S. attorney say is heard and seen, she then pulls him on his back to bring him to the ground, holding him around the neck until his body went limp and he became unresponsive, lying on the driveway. Then she stands up. This is all from the U.S. attorney's office. She then stands up picks up her husband's cell phone, the one that she threw out of his hand. She removes his smartwatch. I'm going to guess it's an Apple watch. I have no idea. But think about it. She removes his Apple watch. Then she turns the vehicle engine off, and that stops the recording. That's where the recording stops. So as we're moving along here in this, what Amanda injected was M99, a controlled substance, 1,000 times more potent than a morphine. So you can imagine it, there, there was no saving him. There was no saving him. Then ultimately, Amanda admits that she disposed of the car and that she buried his body in the woods. But what I'm going to tell you now is what happened that weekend. They pre-dug the hole for the man before they killed him. This is it's it's this is 24 to 48 hours of nothing short of a heinous murder plot unfolding in Ohio. I mean, absolutely, this is a premeditated murder. And I mean, if, if there's any question, the fact that a grave is dug near a family farm site that uh, of her family's waiting for his body. It, there's nothing else you need to know other than, well, there's more. You know, we have this incredibly weird controlled substance that had to be shipped in 
from South Africa, which we will get to. But this is all very meticulous planning and it and it is done with her boyfriend and her mom. Oh, it's so sad. Trying to figure out when and how to start investing can be intimidating. I remember when words like IRAs and portfolios were another language, but investing doesn't have to be scary or hard. Today's episode is sponsored by Acorns. Acorns makes it easy to start automatically saving and investing for you, your kids, and your retirement. You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with just your spare change. Acorns recommends an expert-built portfolio that fits you and your money goals, then automatically invests your money for you. And now Acorns is putting their money into your future. Open an Acorns Later I IRA and get up to a 3% match on new contributions. That's extra money for your retirement. It's important to take charge of your future and Acorns is a great and easy way to get started. Head to acorns.com slash true crime or download the Acorns app to start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. View important disclosures at acorns.com slash true crime. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office, Amanda had considered killing her husband for a year before this murder. She had called her boyfriend, the one in South Africa, while he was in South Africa, and asked him, because who does this? Asked him to find someone to kill Timothy. Can can I, can we stop here, right? Because the boyfriend is in South Africa. Timothy works for the State Department. And you're calling this guy to kill your husband. Are you are you kidding me? Like, how, what are you thinking? Again, so many decisions along the way. Now, what I don't feel like we have a, a, a strong handle on might be what their relationship was like while they were married, right? So we don't, mm-hmm. the record isn't complete on, on what their relationship was behind closed doors. And, and we will probably never know why she has this vitriol towards her ex-husband. However, the heartlessness of, of all of this, even if you're just looking at the effect on the children, it is extreme to say the least. But she is calling her boyfriend in South Africa to find a hitman for her in Ohio. It makes no sense. It makes zero sense. And when she was given an opportunity at sentencing to say something, to explain herself, right? Like, why did you do this? She didn't say because he was a horrible person, which no one has said. I mean, she not that there is an answer that will ever justify murder, but she didn't say any of that other than she said, I guess I'm just really selfish. I'm like, duh, lady, if that's what you think is your biggest problem, whoa, you really are out of touch with reality and your world. You are just out of touch. So let's get back to the boyfriend in South Africa and this request for a hitman because it's it's kind of important. So apparently the boyfriend admits to asking an acquaintance if he could perhaps find two potential hitmen, but that didn't work out. Really? 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 Okay. So then somehow it is suggested, this is the murky part, is suggested that he, they, the people who want this man dead, use M99, which is the animal tranquilizer. So according to the amazing and detailed reporting of LimaOhio.com, extraordinary work. They were in the courtroom for the six hours of hearing. And in the six hours of hearing, um, a lot of there was a lot of testimony. Witnesses were testifying because the judge was trying to figure out what the sentences were going to be. So it was, um, you know, just filled with all these great details. And again, this is coming from LimaOhio.com. And we, we just want to praise them for their hard work on this um, because they were able to, to really fill in the gaps for us in the reporting. So the tranquilizer is 
suggested, I suppose, by someone who knows about these things. And according to the testimony, what happened is he had to figure out how he was going to get the tranquilizer out of South Africa. So he des- he decides to smuggle it out in a little vial and it was hidden in some jewelry. Just so interesting. And it is shipped in February of 2022. Timothy is killed in April. So it is shipped in February in advance of all this from the boyfriend to Amanda. So that's that's the detail of how they got the tranquilizer in and somehow nobody noticed it at the Postal Service. <laughs> and he had to get the tranquilizer from a vet in yes. South Africa. So he, he, he took the time to go to a vet. Now, I, I don't know how how he got it from that vet, it probably through some illegal means, unless he had large animals, but um, there was, there is a vet in South Africa that also helped this murder in some way. So that's how the tranquilizer got into the United States. Now um, I kind of am going to go back and forth in the timeline here, because remember police are first alerted to the disappearance of Timothy. They don't know he's been murdered. All they know is he hasn't returned to his hotel room. He's got his stuff in there. Local police call the FBI because we've got a State Department employee now who's disappeared. They believe foul play. It could be anything and it could be incredibly serious in a matter of national security. So that all goes into play. The next clue that is found in real time is Timothy's car. This is all very important. Timothy's car is found in Dayton, Ohio, not near his ex-wife's home where his children are. The license plates have been removed, but the dash camera was not. Of all of the things, of all of the careful planning that she did that went into this crime, um, the pre the pre dug grave, the moved car, the the swapped license plates, there is a dash cam that has everything on video, and that is really an amazing part to this to this modern world, really. And not to mention that he's part of the State Department and this could have been foul play and, and and crazy things. I believe the hotel workers went into his room and saw all of his equipment, you know, and, and they didn't know, they were, they were worried and the police didn't know what to do with it. So they called the FBI because all of these national secrets could be, could be out there based on, on him missing and, we have a dash cam of of a an angry ex-wife murdering her ex-husband. So the authorities knew immediately who they were looking for, who the suspects were in this case. They knew immediately when they found his car with the license plates missing. So again, let's get back into the weekend. According to LimaOhio.com, they report that Timothy's murder in earnest, the planning began on Friday. Judge makes a ruling, murder plot, hit the button, it's time, and everyone goes into motion. So the boyfriend, he testified that he dug the hole and dug it the day before, so it was premeditated. Then the boyfriend testified that Amanda and her mother, you know, also were part of digging this two foot deep grave several yards inside some dense wood on a piece of property that was formerly owned, I believe, by Amanda's grandfather. What is it with this family? I mean, that that is they're going to bury her ex-husband on, on a in connection with their own land or land they know exists because their family owned it. I mean, this this probably would have unraveled at some point mm-hmm. had we not had the dash cam, but it would have taken time. And apparently, according to all this testimony, that Anita Green, this would be grandma, the grandma 
again, was in on the plot, knew what they were going to do, was part of the digging of the hole and driving to the location where he would be buried. And she even agreed, um, you know, to help with the driving of the body. This is crazy, this family. So the boyfriend testified that, again, according to LimaOhio.com, that after the children had taken their baths and were in bed, the plan is then set into motion. I, you know, how horrible is that? I just keep thinking of the innocence of the dropping off of the kids, taking the car seats out. I have a surprise for you. Have a nice little relaxing bath. Put you to bed. Good night, sweetie. We love you. Horrible. A, a regular old day in those kids' lives, everything appearing normal. But meanwhile, there is your dad's dead body in a car outside waiting to be taken to an already dug grave and his car disposed of in some way that they think would eliminate the the evidence. I mean, it is, how did three people come together and think this was a good idea? That yeah. this, that it's amazing how three people from separate walks of life really could different ages, you know, grandma, she's lived a lot longer, boyfriend is is from an entirely different continent um so there's three people with diverse backgrounds that all collectively thought yes this is a let's let's put this plan in motion oh and they even argued about things according to the boyfriend's testimony um he had suggested maybe they should put him in a pond that i guess they were going to do some digging in the pond or, or they were going to fill the pond and the mother and the grandmother are like no 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 let's put him in the grave on the property so i mean they're even arguing about this and not one just like said you know what this is crazy let's all just go home now let's just stop this and let's just go home but of course they can't because the man is dead already you know once once they've gotten to that that point now they have to dispose of of timothy's body so the boyfriend said that he helped amanda load tim's body uh, which had been wrapped in plastic into amanda's car with the children's grandmother then driving them to the burial site so everyone here is complicit so then amanda had to relocate timothy's car so the boyfriend helped with that because the car now had to be moved to Dayton without the license plates. Uh, apparently, like they wiped down the vehicle. They removed all of the husband's belongings. They removed the license plates, but not the dash cam. It's it, it, there. It's like such clouded vision going forward. Such executing on a plan that no one has the sense to stop, and then disposing of all of this evidence and maybe not Googling whether that car had a dash cam. Just fascinating. Just <laughs> fascinating. So of the three of them, the boyfriend has cooperated the most because he led police to the body. And at sentencing, he got some consideration for his cooperation and the judge acknowledged that he felt that the man was genuinely remorseful or at least showed remorse where he didn't feel the same way about, you know, the, the wife and her mother. And this is when it gets even more interesting when you say we don't know much about this family. Well, little nuggets of details were shining during the sentencing. This is so intriguing to me. At the sentencing for Anita Green, this is grandma. Okay, her two other daughters, her daughters. So grandma's two daughters, which would be, you know, Amanda's sisters. They testified against their own mother and family in support of their victim, their former, you know, brother-in-law, Timothy. It's, it's just amazing. So Anita Green's daughters requested of the judge, they said, they want their mother to be given the maximum sentence. They described their mother as a, quote, liar and manipulative narcissist. Holly Green said, quote, 
I know with every fiber of my being she was involved, she can't be trusted to be let out. Wow. Wow. That, that is powerful from her daughter trying to keep her mother in prison for a crime that wasn't even committed against her immediate family. Mm -hmm. She just knew that her mother and maybe her mother started it. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows who's, you know, not right here. But clearly both business. of them. Well, right? All of them. Well, yeah, yeah all of them for sure. <laughs> All for sure. But there's a whole DNA problem here between the mother and, and the daughter. So U.S. Attorney Rebecca Lutzko said that Amanda's violent and intentional actions were cold-blooded, calculated, and cruel, and that she had complete disregard for how his murder would affect their innocent children is incomprehensible and unforgivable. And that's the missing chip here. It's like, how can you do this to your children? You claim you need and love them so much you can't let them out of your sight, yet you are willing to take their father from them. That's right. And that is the that is cold blooded. She's right. When she calls herself selfish, the the fact that Anita's own daughter is calling her a narcissist, it sounds like Amanda likely has a personality disorder as well. And that is incredibly narcissistic. She is, you know, my children are only fine with me. They're only good with me. I love them so much, except I don't love them enough not to break their hearts and shatter their lives by killing their father. It, setting aside the hate she had for Timothy. I mean, I, I am I am accepting that as as normal. A, a, a hatred, not a not murder, but not normal, but normal for her, husband. right? Mm -hmm. Normal for her, mm -hmm. but to then also destroy the lives of her kids is more than she even thought, because of course now everybody's gone. But to destroy her children's lives and the heartbreak that they would experience with their dad being murdered is is really just it shows the cold blooded. It shows the heartlessness. And the evil that went into this plan. Oh, she's evil. Oh, they're evil without question. Evil, evil, evil. So Timothy, the victim here, of course, his mother, brother, and uncle spoke at sentencing about this devastating loss for their family again. And with their focus being on how this is affecting the children, the children left behind, and how this is just haunting their entire family. Uh, Amanda... She pleaded guilty and received a 40-year prison sentence, followed by 10 years of supervised release. She's, you know, in her 30s. And then she's also been ordered to pay $2 million in restitution, but the money is meant for the girls. Like, where is this $2 million going to come from? Restitution is often not paid. That they they These orders are made and they're often not fulfilled, but should she ever make a dollar, they are going to take it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, as they should. So Amanda was given an opportunity to speak at sentencing and the reporter for LimaOhio.com reports that she was trembling as she read her statement and she was crying. This is when I have no sympathy for her at all. I don't like this woman. But now I kind of despise her. Oh, let me hold on a second. You're feeling fear. You're scared. Do you have any idea how those three girls are feeling scared without their parents and what you did to Timothy? I'm just give me a break. Now you cry. Oh, boo hoo. Boo hoo. Oh, drives me crazy. So she reads her statement with her crocodile tears saying, quote, I wish I could explain to you why I did what I did. No matter how hard I try to explain my actions, it comes down to me being selfish. She didn't have a good reason to kill him. There was she not that there could be. She did not have a good reason to kill him. She cannot. If that, that is it. That is all she can say. That, that is, 
you, she had to accept responsibility to get that plea agreement. And I, I think, Anna, that is a good agreement. I think her plea agreement, she'll serve about 80% of federal time. So she'll be in um, around 32 years. And I think that's a pretty light sentence given this fact pattern. I, I really do. If she were in a state court with premeditated murder, that is often just a life sentence, end of story. I think for this crime, she got off lightly. I agree with you, Rachel. I think this is a light sentence for her mm -hmm. because there is the possibility that she could be in her 60s, maybe 70s if it's delayed, and she could get out and still live a life. And I don't think that that's fair. I agree. I don't think that's fair. This was premeditated. This was not heat of the moment. That is a different story with different sentences. This is not heat of the moment. This was thought out for almost a year, at least two months. She had the poison in advance. She was biding her time, waiting for the opportunity and maybe just the little push over the edge that that court order gave her when they when the judge allowed the the children to be with their father for two months during the summertime. Incredibly a normal thing to do. But that this this was thought out. This was not he was chasing her around and and she did this in the heat of the moment or in self-defense. She had no excuse. Nothing of course could justify it, but nothing really even was mitigating it um, as I see the facts. Rachel, can I ask you a crazy question? Sure. So it just came into my head because I'm suspicious of everything. So had this been moved to a state court and had it been a murder charge and she maybe wouldn't take a plea, do you think that maybe some secrets would have been revealed, um, state secrets like espionage, kind of like State Department stuff, and that's why they didn't move it to state court? I do think, Anna, something else is going on. I, I really do. I okay. think something else was going on behind the scenes jurisdictionally as to why this state and federal court. So what, what her charges all revolved around was the controlled substance. So the, the charges were regarding really the, the international shipping of that elephant poison. Um, and so that's where she pled. There's She pled to four different charges relating to a controlled substance one, which is the highest level and resulting in death. But that's often a very different kind of fact pattern. I mean, that's usually a drug deal fact pattern, or we've seen Matthew Perry lately. That's that kind of fact pattern where it's distributing a narcotic without a prescription for the you know for illegal purposes that kind of thing that this is a very unusual fact pattern because really the controlled substance is a side issue she was murdering her husband um it's just this was the weapon so i really do think something else was up the feds wanted to retain jurisdiction and the state let them do this and and they pled it out in this way. So I, I do. I think there's a little bit of an underpinning that we we don't fully know. Yeah. And all I could think of it, that it has to be the State Department connection, because why no other case would be treated this way. It's just very, very unusual. Anyway, I'm suspicious of everything, you know. Uh, <laughs> so um, let's continue on with sentencing here. Amanda's mother, Anita Green, was sentenced to 10 years in prison with two years of supervised release after pleading guilty to being an accessory to the crimes. And Anita Green, grandma, said at sentencing that she had that she always prayed for Tim's family every day. Isn't that great? Why didn't you pray for some clarity on this issue and directing your daughter to make better choices? I think that would have been a much better prayer a more right. focused prayer. And um, this is interesting. So Timothy's brother, you know, Timothy's the victim here. His brother, this is what he said about the boyfriend. Remember, this is the boyfriend who was like cheating on his brother, this brother's wife. So 
Very interesting. He said, quote, about the boyfriend. He helped in the murder, but he also helped in the investigation. This does not absolve Anthony for his role in murdering my brother. I sense, and I don't know how much families are ever permitted to be part of the process when it comes to taking a plea deal, if they ever get a say, and that's one of the things that always bothers me. But there is a consistent acknowledgement here, not just from the judge, but now from um, Timothy's brother, that the boyfriend tried to help here. And I, there's gratitude is not a good word. I think just acknowledgement that at least they were able to find his body and learn the rest of the details about what was really going on. Yeah, I agree with you. And the U.S. attorney would have been um, in close contact with the family members, particularly as it relates to sentencing. And in the plea agreement, while they might not have an exact say, they do clear these things and uh, sometimes. And so that they, they were aware of what was happening and they were pro they were probably not thankful, of course. But once your your family member has been taken from you, um, you do want answers. And so it sounds like Anthony maybe woke up from a, a really sorry haze and was like, oh my God, what have we done? And started providing answers. And whether he did that to lessen his sentence, because of course the cooperation lessened all of their sentences, uh, the fact that they came forward, even though their you know goose was pretty cooked, um, with the dash cam, but the fact that they came forward and you get more points off of your sentencing, the more cooperative you are. So it sounds like Anthony really tried to go above and beyond, at least on the back end. Yeah. And, you know, didn't do the right thing from the beginning, but maybe when finally faced with a final opportunity to try and do the right thing in real time that he did. In, in showing them where he was buried and getting this man a proper burial. So um, Anthony's family flew in from South Africa for sentencing. And this is described again by the great reporting of uh, LimaOhio.com that he broke down crying. He said he was ashamed for his role. He said, quote, from the bottom of my heart, I am so sorry that I allowed I allowed this to happen, he said, and I would trade my life for Timothy's in a heartbeat. Um, I think, and he did, he allowed this to happen. So mm -hmm. then the judge acknowledged the boyfriend, uh, the statement that the boyfriend made, and that um, he said, really, of the three, he was the only one who was actually sorry. How sad is that? How sad is that? And the judge said, quote, I believe that you are sorry to your core. The only reason we're talking about the number of years in prison, because that's what the sentencing was about. We're talking about this now because of your contrition and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And so Anthony is 36 years old and he has received an 18 year prison sentence as well as three years of supervised release. So he will be released the earliest of the three. The judge said at sentencing, I always find the judge's um, comments to always for me to be the most telling because they see and they hear everything. He's that the judge said that this crime, this is as bad a crime as I have seen or could have imagined. What is it? That's really telling. It really is telling. So, and that judge has seen a lot of crime. So, yeah, that is a telling statement. And it sounds like the judge saw Tim, uh, Anthony's remorse, his cooperation. I mean, when you think of Anthony, a lot of what he did, he did from South Africa. So he's he's not feeling it as he's doing it. He's not feeling it as he's going to the veterinarian and getting the tranquilizer. He's not feeling it as he's putting that in the mail. It's it probably felt a little far off and not real. And then, of course, he arrives in the United States and, and he helps dig the grave. But I think along the way, a lot of the planning portion, yes, he was involved, but probably to a much lesser degree. He was executing a plan that he was likely not fully grasping 
until it happened. Oh, this is just such a hideous, horrible, disgusting, sad crime. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. I don't know. I have a feeling we'll never see that video because, again, we're dealing with a former member of the State Department. So I, I think everything has been very tightly controlled on this one. Tightly controlled. So I don't... I'd be curious to hear what everyone thinks, uh, if you'll comment on YouTube, whether you believe that this is justice, if you think that the sentences are fair. Because I don't think this would have been a hard case to prosecute. You have the evidence. <laughs> it's a slam dunk. So it's not like you're risking. It's like, oh, what will the jury do? I think the jury will sentence them to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Right. That's right. I, I, I do believe something else was at play. Likely. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. We um, we don't have comments today because um, we we occasionally get to have a vacation <laughs> and Will is enjoying a lovely vacation. So he's not with us today for comments and we do miss him, but he'll be back next week. We hope. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, Rachel, where can people find you and follow you on social media? So I'm at Law and Rachel on Instagram, and my law firm web address is zfzlaw.com. Excellent. You can find me at Anna G News. You can find this podcast and all of our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimenews.com. And if you want to watch True Crime News, the TV show, we've got a directory for you on the website because every city plays the show at a different time. It's every day. We're on every day. It's a half hour of amazing crime stories. Kind of what we do here. We do a deep dive on two cases, but we are also covering all the headlines. There's just so much going on right now. It's just, you know, we're watching the Menendez brothers. Will the LA County District Attorney do something, perhaps release them? We're watching Sean Diddy Combs um, in custody. Trial date has been set for May. We're watching the Delphi murders of Libby and Abby who were killed on the bridge. That trial is starting. Also starting is the case of Sarah Boone, who's been called the uh, suitcase killer out of Florida. She's charged. So the alleged suitcase killer out of Florida, she's the woman who, you know, zipped her boyfriend into a suitcase and then he dies and she's claiming it's self-defense. So uh, we're watching a lot of cases right now. So I encourage all of you to just keep tabs on everything at all our different either I mean, just wherever. It's YouTube, it's TikTok, it's Instagram, it's the website, it's the television show. <laughs> We're everywhere. 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 Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. It's been wonderful to see you again, Rachel. I know we'll see you soon. So until next time, this is True Crime News, the podcast. See you next time, everybody. Bye.